I am going to start things off. Um, I am incredibly excited about today. Uh, I know I say that at the start of all of these of, of these webinars, but today we're having a slightly different format. Um, uh, we have three wonderful speakers, um, all, all all CEPR members, and and uh, but but also all incredibly active uh, researchers in this field and in the monetary economics uh, area in general. Um, the discussion today is going to be on the idea of information effects. Um, the, just so you all know, the format will be, we will start with sort of 10 minutes or so presentation from each of the speakers. The order is going to be in the reverse order in which they were listed on the, on the, on the, um, on the flyer. So we'll start with Giovanni Rico from the University of Warwick. And then um, we will have, oh, sorry, not the reverse order. Then we're going to go to Michael Bauer in, from Hamburg. And then uh, Anna Cislack from Duke will will follow up. Um, the, the 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 topic today is that of information effects. Um, and and actually, what's interesting about the information effects literature for those of you who are here because you're interested in communication, um, it's clearly related to communication. Although I would argue the first paper that really pushed the idea of information effects, the Romer and Romer 2000 AER. Most of the data set that they used, or in fact, all of the data set they used was at a time when there was essentially no, um, at least statements that accompanied the decisions of the FOMC at the time. So since then, communication has come a long way. Um, there have been a lot of papers. I mean, a lot of people, there's a, there's a, there's a few people here sort of on the panel as well who, who have contributed to here uh, on, on issues related to the fact that markets react to monetary events, monetary communication events, monetary policy changes. Um, Rafet and Eric obviously have uh, their famous paper with Brian and other work as well. But I guess the question that we're sort of left with still is what is it? What is the information that's driving the reactions that, 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 that we can see in lots of these studies? And then more precisely, how much of that relates to this idea of a private information or something that changes the views of markets about, say, the outlook for inflation or, or, or the economy? There's a ton of great papers. And the reason I'm excited so much about this presentation is that I, I think they're, 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 it'll be a friendly and good chance to discuss all these ideas. And for those of you who are joining who are grad students, hopefully, you know, you'll also see some, some gaps in our, in our collective knowledge or, or things that we would all agree we'd like to see, which is a great way to find the next paper. But that's more than enough from me. Uh, Giovanni, would you like to start sharing your screen? And we will hand the, uh, the floor to you for, for the next sort of 10 minutes or so. Thanks for the invitation uh, to this great uh, panel. So let me go straight into the matter, the, what I'm going to discuss. So I'll, I'm going to do three, uh, three things. First of all, I'll try and think about what are information effects. I will uh, second try and convince you that these information effects, so things that look like them, are widespread across central banks and across the yield curve maturities. And then I will discuss the relationship between uh, monetary surprises and structural shocks. And I will leave some uh, things for the discussion later. There's a huge literature, a growing one, very exciting, lots of important papers. I'm not gonna review them, unfortunately. Uh, so let me start about what are information effects. So as we all know, in a full information rational expectation model, that's the benchmark or intuition. The agent and the central bank share the same information effect, the same information set. It's a full information set, it's perfect. They know everything. So a policy announcement can only reveal information about the bank shock itself, the monetary policy shock. There's no other information can reveal. And in fact, as we know, in the framework of the rational expectation econometrics of the 80s, what is a news to the agent is a structural shock. However, if we relax the assumption of full information and rational expectation, then policy actions or policy announcement can disclose information, can signal information about either the fundamentals or the central bank's expectations or the policy preferences. Now, to, to, to make an example to an agent that is imperfectly informed about the fundamentals, a surprise tightening can mean two things, either stronger than expected fundamentals or a monetary policy shock. However, agents in real time may not be able to fully disentangle these two uh, components. So that's to uh, be kept in mind. And also an important sort of uh, things to keep in mind is that the central bank does not need to have a superior information set 
in order to generate information and facts. It only needs to have an independent signal as compared to, to market participants. Now, we don't observe how agent change the expectations at the moment of monetary policy announcement. However, we observe how asset prices change at the moment of the announcement. And that's the idea that has been pioneered uh, by Agricanax uh, and Swans in the paper in which they look at uh, changing prices in the federal funds futures around tight windows at the moment of the announcement. So that's what we call monetary policy surprises. So we observe the prices before the announcement. The announcement comes in at noon in this case, and then there's a change in prices, and that's what we call a monetary policy surprise. Now, what is that? There are two components first. There is a change in expectations about the interest rates or the part of the rates, and there might be a change in risk opinion. These are two important bits. And for example, uh, Anna, that we'll discuss later, has done great work on the second component as well. But now we might want to unpack what is in expectation revisions because there are lots of things that, that can happen. So let's think of a simple case in which we have a Taylor rule with R star, the equilibrium interest rate, a cyclical component responds to uh, the cyclical component of prices and output gap, maybe some announced deviation from the rule for a guidance and a monetary policy shock. Now, if agents have to form expectations with an imperfect information set before the announcement, they might revise them after the announcement. So what will be that? There will be some potentially change of expectations about the long run of the economy, our star. That's where the paper of Nakamura Stenson has done some really interesting work. Or they can change the expectation about the fundamentals, the cyclical component, how to gap and inflation, maybe. That's where the work of uh, Sylvia and I, or the work of uh, Peter and Mark uh, has been sort of uh, providing some, uh, some advancement, perhaps. Or they might change the expectation about the policy uh, rules, the policy preferences. And that's where uh, uh, Michael and Eric uh, will be entering the discussion later. In their opinion, maybe agents don't, don't update the policy parameters, but they keep making mistakes. And then, of course, there is a last term at our monetary policy shocks. Now, how we can disentangle these two things? And for the moment, let me only focus on information versus monetary policy. That are two probably major uh, bits of that, uh, on that uh, update of information. So we can either do a direct approach, what is the survey-based approach has been initially proposed by uh, Campbell, Campbell et al, looking at for a guidance, and then it has been applied by Sylvia and myself. Uh, and in this approach, you want to use forecast from the agents, and in particular, a forecast from the central bank that for the US are private, in order to look at the correlation between the uh, monetary policy surprises and the fundamentals. There's a different approach that is market based, and in that case, that's the approach of uh, uh, the paper of Jorzinski Karadi, but also uh, many works uh, by Anna and Quotas. You will look at the correlation between stock and bonds at the moment of the announcement to distinguish information from monetary policy shocks. This second approach focuses only on the market information set and therefore has to have a strong assumption about markets being able to disentangle on impact these effects. Now, other information effects, well, something you can do is just to run as we do in, uh, in our paper, a regression on monetary policy surprises onto the Green Book forecast and updates of the Green Book forecast from one month to the following one. Now, under full rational expectations, the correlation should be zero. All of the coefficients in front of the Green Book forecast should be zero. However, we find that these coefficients are not zero. And in fact, you see in these two tables the projection on the monetary policy price of the target factor, the moments at the short end of the yield curve and of the path for the US. And if you focus on the middle of this table, you see that the, the forecast for the, uh, for the next quarter uh, is significant and there's some R squared around 7%, not huge, but it's there. And if you look at the path, the, the R squared is bigger up to 10% on the first forecast, uh, but also the uh, nowcast is important somehow. So there's information there, apparently. Um, market might realize or not the different components, but there's clear, a clear sort of information part in this monetary surprise. And this is a finding that this holds across central banks, 
Uh, I've been uh, working on uh, South African data with colleagues from there. It holds for South Africa, it holds for the uh, Euro area, it holds for the United Kingdom. Constantly, we find that monetary policy surprise correlates with the central bank forecast. And this is, for example, the case for the QE, the long end of the maturity curve now. Uh, and you see that the R square is pretty high and correlates with uh, the forecast, a different horizon, up to 20% R square. So information effects appear there, or something looks like them. Now, does it matter for the identification? Yes. Why it does? Because monetary policy surprises in event studies are news and are considered as news with respect to the information set to market participants. So it's a, a legitimate they use. However, in order to identify ca causal effects of multiple policy shocks, we need to isolate exogenous variation uh, in, the, in the policy rule orthogonal to the state of the economy that are also innovation uh, to, the, to the agents. So you have to be at the boundary, the cross between the information set of the central bank and the information set of the agents of the markets. Now, as I was saying, in a rational expectation model, the two coincides, not in the real world, not in a world in which there's imperfect information. And in such a world, news to the agent are not the structural shocks and is different from the rational expectation econometrics of the 80s. And in fact, the econometrician often has a superior information set compared to the agents. And that's a complete upside down statement with respect to the usual statement of rational expectation econometrics. The other point that is important to make is that even if the information effects are small, as in the case of the target, as was mentioning, this can generate large price puzzle, a large output puzzle. And we explained this in a paper that has been recently accepted, Jamie, on IV methods in structural DRs. And the reason is very simple. If shocks are pervasive, they will contaminate largely the impulse response functions. The other sort of important point is that this is compatible with the presence of small or no information advantage from the Fed. As long as the Fed is independent, if you want signal, then it will move the market because it's a new signal to the market. Uh, and then I come back to that point later. So I think I have probably just one minute. So let me wrap up just showing two uh, impulse response function. These are the impulse response function uh, for the monetary policy shock um, identified using as an instrument, the residual of the regression I was showing you before, monetary policy surprises onto the Green Book forecast, while the fitted component is what we call information shock. And as you can see, while the monetary policy shock has across the board contraction effects with no puzzle, an information shock appears as a demand shock, essentially, with expansionary effects across the border that are very clear and with a very different shape, if you want, of the loading of the uh, yield curve at short and longer maturity. And now with uh, Ricardo Gasperi, we extended these results to the uh, path factor and we find similar results. Information uh, component has expansion effects, the four guidance component for tightening has uh, recessionary effects. And probably I should stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. I should say, if you have questions, uh, please ask them, but we're going to give each of the presenters their chance to, to present, and then we'll, we'll come back and ask questions kind of collectively. Um, fantastic. That was perfectly on time and a, a lovely introduction to the topic and, and of course, your own work. Uh, so let me hand over now straight to, uh, to, to Michael Bauer. And um, yeah, I shall... Uh, I shall let you uh, you present for the next 10 or so minutes and, and, and then we'll go to Anna. Cheers, Michael. Great, thanks. Okay, so yeah, I want to give a slightly different perspective on information effects. My starting point is going to be the evidence in Nakamura and Steinson um, and some related papers. Um, so if you look at survey forecasts um, and how they are correlated with monetary policy surprises, then you get what may seem from the perspective of a new Keynesian model, the wrong response. So you'll see that hawkish surprises, so increasing rates around an FOMC announcement are often correlated with upward revisions of macro forecasts. So, uh, you know, output and employment in particular and vice versa for, for dovish surprises. So, and that's obviously the other sign than what we would think for, um, a contractionary monetary policy shock uh, should should do. So, you know, 
Uh, one explanation that is presented in Nakamura Steinson's paper and that uh, Giovanni explained very well is, is you know, these information effects. So if the surprises convey private information about the economy, or I guess to some extent, un partly uncorrelated information or new information about the economy, um, then that can directly affect the public's belief. And so that's a possible uh, explanation. You know, if that is really going, what's going on, if that, that is an important uh, factor, then that has substantial implications beyond just explaining these survey regressions, but also for the effectiveness of monetary policy, for empirical macro and structural VARs, like what Giovanni was talking about. So it's a pretty important question, um, how, how large information effects are. But is, is there another explanation of this type of evidence? And I'll, I'll argue, I'd argue also of some of the results Giovanni showed. So if you look at the scatter plot of, of the data in Nakamura Steinson, you'll have on the here on the horizontal axis the monetary policy surprise, some summary statistic of changes in, in interest rates in the 30 minutes around the FOMC announcements, and on the vertical axis, change in the real GDP forecasts in the blue chip um, uh, over the month uh, spanning the, the FOMC announcement. Now you see this positive correlation that is so puzzling. But what you note is that a lot of the most influential observations, on the uh, they seem to really be correlated with the business cycle situation. So, so just uh, to emphasize the points on the lower left, there are very big easings. The story here is these big easing surprises um, signal a, a bad situation, bad economic situation, and the market, the forecaster, the public is taking that on board. So, so from the causality going from the FOMC announcement to the forecasters. But there seems to be an omitted variable here. There seems to be the state of the business cycle. These are all times of, of it when the economy was very doing very poorly that might be causing both the monetary policy surprise and the uh, forecast update. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of the story we investigate, Eric Swanson and I, in, in one of our papers. Um, so we emphasize that everyone's responding to the news, the Fed, the forecasters. Um, and and this, this pattern that Giovanni showed, you know, that FOMC announcement surprises are correlated with um, the green book data, this is also true for publicly observable economic and financial data. Uh, it, it, and that's documented in a variety of papers. Okay, so, so our point is that this is an omitted variable bias, uh, an omitted variable in these regressions. So we need to account for this. And this also has another consequence, of course, that you need to be careful when using monetary policy surprises. They are predictable. Um, so just complementing what, what Giovanni said. But let me show you what happens to in these standard regressions when you regress the blue chip forecast revision for the unemployment rate, real GDP growth, and inflation on measures of the monetary policy surprise you tend to get the wrong sign. That's this upper panel that is um, you know, consistent with the findings in uh, several papers, including the Nakamura Science and paper. The R squares are really small. There's not often statistical significance here emphasized in boldface at the 5% level, um, but they tend to have the wrong sign. But if you control for the situation, uh, the economic and financial variables at the time of the announcement, using only data that's observed before the announcement, as Eric and I do in our paper, then the signs almost always flip and have uh, you know, significant, they are statistically and economically significant on, on the other side of zero. So you get the conventional signs. So that means that um, there is an omitted variable uh, bias. And since it can be, fixed by accounting for publicly observable information, we don't think this, uh, you need an information effect uh, explanation for these results. Okay. 
Okay, so I also have a similar slide as Giovanni, but you know, how, you see how simple this is shows, you know, I have a much lower degree of sophistication here in my policy rule on this slide and maybe more generally. This is a very simple policy rule. A monitor policy surprise, if I'm ignoring changes in the risk premium, can be due to a monetary policy shock. It can be due to an information effect where the public uh, doesn't know the state of the business cycle and, and its beliefs differ from the true state of the business cycle, or X. Um, but there can also be a you know, discrepancy between the public's view of the monetary policy function and uh, the, the true um, re reaction function, right? So, so incomplete knowledge about the reaction function can explain. So that would mean A is not equal to A hat, right? And that can explain this puzzling correlation of the monetary policy surprises with economic and financial data. Um, so, so it can explain uh, the type of predictability um, that Giovanni showed and that we show in our papers. Um, if, if this A is like systematically different from A hat, you know, if on average A is bigger than A hat, for example, right? And um, this is plausible uh, since it's pretty hard to learn about the monetary policy rule and, and the Fed has become ever more responsive to um, the you know the economy over time, as as evident from a variety of uh, comments by you know the FOMC and also by some uh, empirical evidence. So it's pretty plausible that A is bigger than A hat. The Fed is a little bit. The market has underestimated the responsiveness of the Fed to economic data, and then you get uh, a correlation between the economic data and the monetary policy surprise. Um, and you get this kind of omitted variable bias. So this is an alternative channel um, that explains these survey responses. And you know, it also explains the correlation of the monetary policy surprises with um, you know, not only the economic data, but also with the survey forecast. Um, let me just show you this, this slide here where you know, I'm kind of replicating some of the results Giovanni had using the Green Book forecasts, where if you, if you regress these policy surprises on Green Book forecasts, you get some pretty high R squared. Um, but you get the same if you use the blue chip forecast. You know, those are publicly observable data. So, um, uh, so that suggests, so this correlation uh, of these, you know, blue chip forecasts with the policy surprise uh, is in line with you know our story here. So we don't think you necessarily need information effects to explain um, the correlation with the Green Book forecasts, since you get very similar correlation with the blue chip forecast. Okay, well, let me zoom out to the, the thirty thousand foot view again. So we're not saying there's no information effects um, ever, uh, and there can't be, but we're just kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit and saying, look, the evidence actually is not as strong. The survey regressions in Nakamura Steinson's paper and other papers, if you they suffer from an omitted variable bias, if you control for that problem, you don't have any uh, puzzling signs there and very much conventional responses. Um, we also have a little new survey of, of of uh, forecasters that uh, also shows no evidence of information effects. Um, we did some additional analysis using forecast accuracy comparison and also digging a little bit more in this financial market response where, um, where we find that there's, there's no, no strong evidence for information effects. So there can be information effects potentially uh, occasionally, but um, we think this is likely more the exception rather than the rule according to our reading of the evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me to speak on, on this topic and to be on the panel. Uh, so here's the question. If 
all that the Fed does is to generate the traditional monetary news via current or expected short rate, then how do we think about the following evidence that has accumulated in the literature? Uh, the, the first uh, is, you know, Fed announcements have economically large effects on long duration risky asset prices. And uh, we know uh, from, uh, from some uh, work that Luke and Manich have done, also my work with Annette Vissing and Adair Morse, that stock returns uh, are high on uh, scheduled FOMC days and at regular uh, intervals over the FOMC cycle. So how can this be uh, if the Fed is just moving the very short end of the curve or the expectations of, uh, of interest rate over some uh, relatively short horizon? So uh, let us think about what kind of news the Fed can induce. Obviously, Fed communication is a complex informational bundle, uh, so the interpretation is challenging. And what could be the Fed doing um, in terms of its policy tools? Well, we have the standard traditional monetary news, uh, huge literature on that. Then we have uh, Fed conveying some information about the economy that, that investors didn't have. This is the Fed information effect. Uh, and finally, the Fed could be influencing the amount or the price of risk that investors perceive. This is uh, the point made by Hansen and Stein and also by our work with Annette and Adair. And by affecting the amount uh, or the price of risk, uh, the Fed affects also the risk premium for exposure either to discount rate news or cash flow news. Think about this as Fed moving around the amount of uncertainty that the public perceives. And these channels are not mutually exclusive. So the key question it seems for us going forward is what is the relative importance of each of these channels for what the Fed actually does? So I've been trying to think about this question in a uh, admittedly very simple way. And uh, in joint work with, uh, with Ha Pang uh, from Fuqua, we came up with a simple new news decomposition uh, where we try to uh, separate the different type of information that the Fed uh, is conveying on announcement days. Uh, and uh, so we try to separate four shocks. We call them structural. Uh, they are just orthogonal sources of variation. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, we try to map them onto the three channels that I mentioned to you. So what we try to isolate is growth news. Think about this as cash flow news. Uh, this is the Fed information effect. Monetary news, which would be the Fed just moving around the uh, short term in risk free rate, essentially. So this is a pure discount rate uh, effect. And then what turns out to be very important is to isolate the effect that the Fed communication has on the risk premium. And these effects could have two flavors. On the one hand side, the Fed could be just reducing the uncertainty about interest rates, about discount rates in the economy. This is what we call the common premium. It comes with a minus because if this risk premium moves up, it's bad news both for the stock market and for the, for the bond market. Alternatively, uh, the Fed could be moving around the amount of perceived uncertainty about the real economy. So it could be changing the compensation for cash flow risk. And we call this uh, the hedging premium uh, comes with a plus. Why? Because it's good news if, if this uh, kind of premium appears, it increases. It's good news for the bond market because of the flight to safety it's bad news for the stock market. So Fed could try to move this component as well. And uh, so uh, what do we do in terms of identification here? Uh, we use sign restrictions on the stock yield co-movement and monotonicity restrictions along the entire yield curve. And the, uh, the full range of restrictions is, uh, is in this table, but let us just let us just briefly think about what these effects look like. Suppose there is a good growth shock. This is positive Fed information effect. What would happen? 
Well, we would expect under relatively standard conditions is that stock returns increase, but also yields move up. This generates positive stock yield movement. Now, suppose that the Fed eases uh, uh, via a standard risk-free rate shock, what happens, yields go down, stock returns do well, uh, st stock returns are high uh, because of lower discount rates. This generates negative stock, bond stock yield movement. What about the risk premium shocks? Suppose that the Fed reduces the amount of discount rate uncertainty in the economy. What is going to happen? Well, yields will move down, bonds will do well, and stocks will do well as well. Uh, so this will generate a negative stock yield movement. Now, if the Fed moves the other component of the premium, uh, that is reduces the amount of the uh, uh, uncertainty about the real economy, what is going to happen, stocks are going to do well, but bonds are actually going to go down. Why? Because they lose some of the hedging uh, value from the perspective of investors, there is less flight to safety. So we combine these restrictions uh, with monotonicity restrictions across the yield curve. And here's what we get. So what I have picked here are some of the information heavy uh, FOMC days. These are essentially the points in the, I guess, Northeast and Southwest rectangle in Michael's scatter plot. And uh, the shocks here are, these are just the shocks that happen given this decomposition on each of these announcement days, uh, of these four announcement days. I just picked four, Michael had four in each of the rectangles. Um, they are expressed in units of standard deviation. And you see that, for example, 1999 November uh, meeting was associated with positive growth news. But the 2003 meeting, given this decomposition, was associated with strong tightening a monetary shock. So similarly, you see this kind of ambiguity in, in interpreting these movements uh, in uh, when there is an easing and economic contraction. 2001 was a bad growth shock, whereas 2007 was a very aggressive monetary easing shock. And uh, the, the uh, sort of takeaway from, for me from this is that uh, the informational bundle uh, is, is changing. Uh, so these announcements are not, do not uh, follow the same logic. Uh, they, they are complicated and they all encompass potentially different sources uh, of variation. Now, you may ask yourself, Given this, the, this decomposition into shocks, what can we say about the traditional surprises like target and past surprises uh, that uh, Rufat, Eric, uh, and co authors have been working on? Um, and uh, what I am going to do here is to run a simple regression of target. This is a high frequency identified shock uh, uh, within a narrow window on the shocks that I identify at the daily frequency uh, using this simple methodology that I laid out. So when you look at the target shock, it, its interpretation is quite clear. It is a pure monetary surprise okay, through the risk-free discount rate. Now, path shock is a much more complicated animal. Suppose we observe a negative path shock. What could it be? Well, it could be bad news about the economy. It could be uh, a monetary easing shock, the Fed announcing interest rates being low going forward, or it could also be a type of news that reduces uncertainty about discount rates. All of this would be revealed as a path shock. Now, notice this positive sign on growth news here. What this is saying is that a path shock does contain some information effect. Uh, there is some news about the fundamentals coming out uh, with that surprise, but this is clearly not the primary source of variation in the path factor. Now, let us think about the uh, effects that the Fed has on risky asset prices. 
And let's run a, another very simple regression of either stock returns or stock return components attributed to each of the shocks that I identify on a constant and FOMC day dummy. So this slope coefficient measures how much higher the return is on average on the FOMC announcement or the return induced by the particular shock. So the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, number here shows you the overall uh, return uh, that accrues on the FOMC days. It's very high. We know this from Luca and Munch. Uh, it is almost 30 basis points on average higher than on other days. But what is driving that high return? Well, uh, this the composition tells us it's not growth news. So what it is saying is that on average, the Fed announcement doesn't deliver systematically positive or negative news about the economy. On average, the, uh, the uh, information effect is zero. The uh, high returns are driven by two, two forces. One is the, um, is the monetary component. You see a positive sign here. What is it? What this is telling us is that on average, over the samples that we study, the Fed has eased more than the public expected, and this is the effect that Michael and and Eric have been alluding uh, to in their work, and and I've done some work on on that as well. The second and the major effect comes from the cumulative effect of the Fed on the risk premium. If you look at this, this is the joint effect of the two risk premium uh, components. This amounts to 70% of the high FOMC day stock market returns. The number is positive, telling us that when the, the announcement comes, the, or uh, when information from the Fed comes out, it is news that reduces the risk premium, either because the Fed reduces uncertainty about the real economy or uh, they reduce uncertainty about discount rates going forward. So the risk premium channel is pervasive, it seems, uh, in uh, Fed communication. Let me move to the conclusions um, and, and uh, just say that uh, it's quite clear that Fed-induced new, uh, news is a complex object. It is not just conventional monetary news. There seems to be some evidence about how the public updates their beliefs about the fundamentals on FOMC days, which would suggest some Fed information, in fact. Probably this is not the primary channel. So it seems that more importantly, what the Fed does it has a significant impact on risk premia uh, via reducing uncertainty and or the risk aversion. And about 70% of uh, on average positive equity returns on FOMC days uh, seem to be stemming from that risk premium channel. Um, so thank you very much and I look forward to your comments. Great, thank you, thank you, Anna. And uh, yeah, so 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 now we get to the uh, the sort of more uh, panel discussion part of uh, of this. So I, I'm gonna. Uh, there are some questions coming in. I have some of myself, but I'm gonna ask if anybody else who's uh, who, who's who's in the panel has any sort of reactions that they want to get. Um, uh, I, I sort of feel like calling on Rafet, but uh, but 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 maybe uh, uh, yeah, he's 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 nodding as if he's welcoming the calling on. So Rafet, uh, can I ask you to chime in with any questions or comments? So um, let me first commend you for putting this group together. It really is wonderful. Um, truly, really is wonderful actually to have all these people together, um, and the presentations were super. Now, um, I guess part of the question here is. Um, I guess one on Anna's work, the, the information effects and the, the composition of the monetary policy surprises depends on what it is that you are trying to do with these things, right? So if I want to understand asset price reactions, sure, you know, the, the more ways I have to decompose these, the better. If I want to use these in a proxy VAR, then I really want to get to the bit that is correlated with the fundamentals, right? You know, uh, market participants thought this was going on, but it really wasn't. I don't really care. Um, 
so so there the Giovanni work becomes more relevant. But on the on the Anna bit, so a lot of what this seems to be resolution of uncertainty, right? Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to understand how it is that this surprise is always something that reduces the risk premium and increases in the stock price, right? And that's nothing special about monetary policy. This is part of every semi-important data release. Right? We observe the same thing in employment reports too. It comes in exactly as expected, stock prices go up. Um, so, and, 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 and there, I think it, it really is an important question to ask if this is the main information bit in there, do I really care about this from a um, instrumental variables perspective? So I, okay, uh, Anna, I think that is a question directly at you. Um, but but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna chip in with a with a bit on top of that, which which may also uh, induce other people on the panel to to come in with other comments. So I, I guess uh, I, I'm gonna do my chair's duty of bringing this back also to explicitly central bank communication. Um, and so I guess part of the question I would add on to uh, on, or maybe the response partly to Rafet is, you know, some of some of the resolution or generation of uncertainty could come through the the language that is used by the, the Fed, and to the degree that so so you describe it almost like it's just because we've seen the data that we have the resolution of uncertainty. The Fed could itself be a source of uncertainty and therefore could be more directly affecting the risk premium. Um, and, 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 and therefore, maybe we do care about that. May, again, maybe not in a proxy VAR sense, but in a, in a central bank design, in, a, in an optimal communication strategy approach, uh, they may want to think about how, how their actions are affecting this channel. Fair enough, but it would then become a question, why is it that this thing goes down um, not only on average, but in a great majority of the cases. Right? It's true that you know the Fed, it's obviously true that the Fed is uh, a source uh, of uncertainty itself if it wants to be, and especially if it you know bumbles the communication. But in general, apparently they haven't. Otherwise, it's difficult to understand how it is that you have these excess returns on the stock prices correlated with reduction in the risk premium so often. Okay. Um so, so we we have that the, the, even just this back and forth has has forced three hands shooting up. So I'm going to go in the order. I'm going to go to Julia, then Bo, and then Saskia. So uh, Julia, I'll start with you. Yeah, th thank you very much to all the presenters for their very very interesting presentations. Uh, my my question is a bit more uh, more general. Maybe um, I. Uh, I thought about that, like listening to Anna, especially, and of this risk premium channel, I was thinking uh, a major uh, change in central bank communication since a, a decade is the introduction of forward guidance. And, and forward guidance can change a bit how, uh, I mean, information effect can uh, basically reach uh, the people. And, and, and also, I think that uh, in general can reduce um, but uncertainty about the monetary policy reaction for for a long period of time, depending on the different forward guidance. So, um, well, my, my question to the to the to the presenters would be how uh, if you found the, any difference in, in forward guidance periods and how uh, this may affect uh, these channels that you presented. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, th this this gives me a great chance because they, they they're not actually represented here, and maybe one of you will want to talk about them in, in, in your response. But I, I think I think Giovanni, you may have mentioned their paper, but the, the work by uh, by Hosh, uh, Barbara Rossi, and um, uh, Sekposian actually, I, I think I'm not sure if they they certainly find that that what we call the information effect seems to have changed in the, exactly the period you're referring to, Julia. But but I'll leave that question on the table. I'm going to take the question from Bo and Saskia, and then we can go around and get get another set. So Bo. Yeah, I, I want to first echo Rafael and Gilia's sentiment that I absolutely love the, the presentations. And thank you, Michael, and the other organizing team for putting such a coherently amazing panel together and for having me today. So my question is for Michael, but um, I'm really curious about, 
Anna and Giovanni's thoughts on this as well. It's really about the perhaps situational nature of the information effect, if you will, because to me, the information effect cannot be a universal phenomenon. It seems like we're all agreeing on that friend. And, but it could be something that may rise to be particularly relevant in a highly uncertain economic environment, right? So this goes back to the point that um, Rafael and Michael and uh, Anna were, were pointing to. I guess the idea is that if you think about these uncertain times, that's precisely the time that the tremendous amount of intellectual capital that is uniquely possessed at the Fed in-house could really gain an edge, right? If you think about these over 400 PhD economists, right, monitoring every corner of the economy, every pocket of the financial sector, literally around the clock. And you think about this sheer volume and granularity of the data, especially when it comes to the financial sector, the Fed could potentially get a better purview of the financial health of the economy in these uncertain times. And another thing about um, uncertain uh, periods of heightened uncertainty is that it's precisely the time when eyes are literally all unfed, right? So what I'm trying to convey is that, Michael, I find your analysis extremely compelling, right? And it's also such a great example of the type of testing and retesting that makes research what it is. What I'm trying to convey is that how open-minded are you and Eric, right, about about the, the, the effect of being there, uh, but, but there is a situational aspect to it, right? So specifically, um, if you think about extreme examples of uncertainty, uh, we can think about these unscheduled monitor policy announcements. Do you see anything there that's different, right? And also you mentioned this blue chip uh, survey respondents that you additionally conducted. So I wonder if there is a sense of asymmetry in the way that right they respond to uh, uh, hawkish versus dovish surprises right thinking about dovish surprises being uh, typically coming out of from these unscheduled monitor policy announcements right this mere sense of urgency to me has got to convey something informational so i guess that um by closing i'll just say that michael my question is do you really do you see your work as uh, as evidence of absence or just absence of evidence vis-a-vis -vis information in fact and what are your thoughts on this um uh, for lack of a better word situational nature of the information in fact okay uh excellent even even your question has prompted uh, eric to life so uh, he, he's also raised his hand but let me go to saskia next uh thanks michael and also i want to uh follow the rest of the speakers. This has been really great. First of all, a great summary of how far uh, we've come, uh, but also it shows with all the discussion points that there's still a long way to go. Uh, but my question is more about uh, the information component and um, uh, the target factor versus the path factor or, you know, the monetary, monetary policy surprise versus central bank communication. Because uh, like Anna was showing that, you know, in her case, she finds that the target is mostly monetary news. Uh, but it seems that when I look at the impulse responses from uh, Giovanni, and this is also something that uh, I find uh, in my paper, uh, doing this for, for Norway and extending the, the framework from Jaroszynski Karate with, with some forward guidance too, is that there seems to be a large information effect in the target factor too, or in the monetary policy surprise. And I find that quite surprising. It's not where you would expect it, right? It, it's, I, I think you would expect it in the central bank uh, information or central bank communication um, that's at least what I would what I would think uh, happened. So I'm just wondering, like, where do you think that that uh, comes from? What could be potential um, explanations? Um, yeah, that's my question. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to take uh, two more. Um, Eric, was yours a hand up to ask another question or to respond? I, I was going to respond since Bo had asked us to uh, to respond. Oh, okay, can I come back to you in just a second then? And uh, so, uh, uh, Athanasios, do you want to uh, unmute and uh, uh, I assume a, a question? Um, sure. Uh, th thanks for the invitation. It's very, very nice to have this, uh, uh, these global events these days. But I'm not sure I have a question. It may be a comment as well, responding to the discussion I've just heard. Of course, my, my reading of what uh, of what Anna presented and the fact that it's uh, it's mostly an effect related to the resolution of uncertainty uh, is something that I find incredibly important for understanding the costs associated 
with messed up communication by central banks and the benefits associated with uh, clarity. Uh, the central banks uh, can create a lot of uncertainty and even though they claim they try not to, uh, the evidence like this actually suggests that they still do. And this is evidence that uh, no matter what the narrative that we see uh, uh, around there, uh, uh, the uh, systematic component of monetary policy uh, is still not uh, uh, that high. It could be much, much bigger. And I would say that a test for success for central banks would be a situation where there is zero news whatsoever when the monetary policy moves because everybody understands what the policy reaction function is. The policy reaction function is communicated directly from the data. And if you, if you consider this extreme and you go to, maybe there should be some news because the central bank has additional information. I heard before, like I, I can't imagine Eric and Refed being among the 400 economies who are 24 seven looking at data, for example. If that's there, then the central bank should do a better job of communicating its information to the public. And this is what markets should be responding to, not uh, whether you know, they had uh, Kellogg's for breakfast that morning and then decided to change the forward guidance uh, or, or raise 50 or 25 basis points. That should not matter. That's just a matter of the inefficiency. So I look at this again as evidence that should prompt uh, uh, the next big question. Can we help central banks improve the communication, be more systematic, and remove this welfare cost uh, that is completely unnecessary from their operations. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to add one more. So, uh, uh, I'm Eric Connery had a question posted online, which um, I'm going to summarize it. I think it, it sort of fits a little bit with Julia's question about whether forward guidance had changed things, and a little bit with Bose. Uh, is this stuff, you know, are they limited to certain events? Um, and uh, but but it's really about whether or not uh, people have sort of followed up and seen anything in the COVID uh, world, which is clearly very different and, 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 and not the fight for central banks, I guess you would argue, at least not the first order fight. Um, and so um, if we try the same work following COVID, you know, are the results any different? So I'm going to throw that in the mix now. Um, and because he's not only because he's waited patiently, but also because he got up for something starting at 7 a.m., for which we are very thankful, Eric. Uh, I, shall, I shall hand the floor now to, to Eric, and then we'll go back around and, uh, and get responses to the questions. I've written everyone's question down, and I will try and hold you all to account to make sure someone answers a bit of everyone's question. Eric. All right, thank you, Michael, and good, good morning, everybody. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, I'll respond to a couple of things that, that Bo mentioned, which is um, the first is that there's, there's often a, a, in, an intuition that people have that the, the Fed does employ a lot of economists. I think there's 400 and some now at the Federal Reserve Board or maybe almost 400. And so then there's the question why surely they should produce a better forecast than blue chip. I mean, since you know, most of your blue chip forecasters have maybe five or six economists on them. Um, you have to remember that it's true that um, if, if, if everybody was forecasting in a vacuum and, or on an island completely isolated from everyone else, that argument would make more sense. But remember, all of these blue chip forecasters see each other's forecasts on Bloomberg terminals. They see it in the, in the monthly blue chip publication, or actually their, their blue chip publication comes out twice a month. So they're very well attuned to what everybody else is forecasting. And so they're not forecasting in, in a vacuum or on an island, that, that they do see each other's forecasters. Uh, each other's forecasts. And if you collectively look at all of them together, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of blue chip um, professional forecasters out there. They have at, at least as much forecasting power as the Fed does. Um, you know, and, and remember, the Fed does not devote all those 400 economists to forecasting. They have a lot of other responsibilities uh, in addition. In, in particular, the FOMC employs the Fed staff to provide them with a lot of conditional forecasts, like counterfactuals, uh, what ifs, you know, so what will happen if we do this? What will happen if we do this other policy? So the Fed staff is devoted primarily to doing all of those counterfactual scenarios to help the Fed out. Uh, they're, they're not so much devoting all those resources to forecasting the, uh, the most likely outcome going forward. So, um, so there's, there's not that much of a raw informational advantage on the Fed side. In fact, you, if, if you look at my paper with Michael that Michael talked about, we did a raw comparison of the Fed's forecasts to the blue chip forecasts, and they're pretty much identical. Um, and Michael and I knew this going into it, that we, we used to look at the San Francisco Fed before every FOMC meeting, we sit around with Janet Yellen going over the Fed forecast. 
and the blue chip forecast and the macroeconomic advisors forecast and comparing them all and discussing which one was better. And it was never clear which one was the better forecast. In fact, sometimes the, uh, the private sector forecasts outperform the Feds. Just think about inflation recently, right? The Fed has been saying inflation will be transitory, inflation will be transitory, inflation will be transitory. And now it's pretty clear that that was wrong, right? And so the Fed's forecast has not been particularly better than the private sector's recently. It hasn't been particularly better for the last 20 or 30 years, as Michael and I showed. Um, and, and so, so there's, you're not going to see that much of an informational advantage coming directly out of the Fed's forecasts. Um, in response to what uh, Giovanni uh, was saying, that maybe you don't have to have the Fed have a better forecast as long as it's sort of an independent one. Um, and that's mathematically true, I admit. All that matters is that there's a signal with some information in it that's not in the private sector forecast. Uh, however, remember, the Fed watches the blue chip forecast very, very, very closely. They know all of the Bloomberg forecasts. They know all of the blue chip forecasts. They know what the private sector is forecasting. And so it's hard for them, if they have any additional information of their own, any independent information, it's going to produce a necessarily strictly better forecast by the Fed, given that they observe the private sector forecast already. So this kind of come back, comes back to Bo's point that if they did have any information of their own, it would show up in a superior forecast. You, you wouldn't, you know, so it's, I, I think mathematically it's fine to argue that it, maybe there's a signal there that's not necessarily superior, uh, but for all practical purposes, it would have to be a superior forecast in the data. Um, there were some questions about forward guidance um, or, or, or intermediate moves, right? Um, let me talk about intermediate moves. Um, let's just think about the most recent intermediate moves, which was in 2020 after the COVID shocks. I don't think it's that the Fed had particular information about COVID that the markets had. They just, you know, the, the economy was developing rapidly. The Fed did not want to wait six weeks for the next FOMC meeting. Uh, and so they cut policy dramatically. Uh, as the news came in. And so the markets and the Fed were both responding to the dramatically worse economic outlook as the COVID data came in. And so that would be exactly in line with what Michael and I have been saying. It's just the Fed is just responding to the same things that everybody is seeing. Uh, in the case of an intermediate move, they're responding quickly because the, the situation demanded it. Uh, and you saw that in 2008 and 2009 also. They responded quickly because things got bad very, very quickly in September 2008. Um, so, so let me, I'll, I'll stop there. And, and if there's more comes up, I can chime in again later. Okay, uh, Rafet, you've raised your hand again. Um, uh, Anna, I am going to come back to you because a couple of things have come up on uncertainty. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a definite chance to, to respond. I'm also going to come back to Giovanni. Y you get a chance to come back as well. Michael, I can come back to you if you want, but uh, I, I'm taking Erica speaking partly for you as well. So uh, uh, let, let's go, go with Rafet. And then uh, I'll go to Anna, then back to Bo, and then to Giovanni. So, um, tacking on to Atanasio's point, um, so Eric didn't talk about this, but uh, he actually has a wonderful paper in the JMCB, right, that shows uh, after the Fed began to issue these statements, actually the size of the perceived market surprise declined substantially. So, um, the fact that the FOMC began to put out these statements clearly made it uh, easier for the market participants to understand what the um, reaction function is, and this is exactly what Athanasios wanted. Now, the bigger question here is whether the damn reaction function is a constant or not, and most likely is not. And if it's not, um, if the underlying uh, thing to be revealed is time varying, then it has to be revealed somehow, right? And whenever it is revealed, whether in a policy meeting or in a policymaker speech or by a press release, or whatever, on its own, it has to have a market impact. So the question here is to what extent we're observing markets reacting to what they learn about the underlying reaction function, even though nothing is happening in uh, to the underlying function, but we haven't done a good job of signaling what the central bank is trying to do, which I think is fairly little. And to what extent it's actually responding to changes in the policy reaction function and they have to, because that change has to be signaled at some point. Perfect. Thank, thanks, Rafet. Uh, Anna, I'm going to give you the floor for, for any response you want to give. Right. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, Rafet asked about uh, the resolution of uncertainty. Uh, 
And uh, the first part of the question was, you know, does it, why, why would it matter? Should we care at all? Uh, in which sense is this a structural, uh, structural thing? So uh, I guess there is, there is a large literature talking about real effects of uncertainty and um, an increase in uncertainty would generate something like a, a effect of a demand shock. Now the Fed seems to be good at offsetting these shocks. So uh, it stands to a reason that, that they would be uh, that they would be trying to do that. Um, uh, they would be trying to reduce uncertainty. So I think we have a lot of evidence that, that uh, you know, uncertainty uh, matters. I don't think this, what we are identifying is mostly Fed created uncertainty. I think there is some state variable um, that the world is uncertain about. And the Fed understands that uncertainty uh, will have some effects and tries to uh, counteract it uh, by providing uh, reassurance. Uh, now, the second part of your question was, how can it be that the Fed is able to do things like that over and over again, over a long sample period? So there is some analogy uh, to uh, say how people have been forming their beliefs about inflation. Inflation went down dramatically in the 80s. But the public was still updating their beliefs about where inflation is going forward uh, for the next 20 years. So we are, you know, even if we look at the sample from the mid 90s, we are still faced with a really short sample. So uh, in that sample period that we so frequently study, it does seem to be the case that the Fed has reduced uncertainty either about discount rates and or about the real economy. Um, and, uh, and we also know that they somehow have been able to deliver this uh, 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 monetary surprises that were more aggressive uh, to, uh, in terms of easing than what the public expected. And again, they, they were able to do it repeatedly. Uh, we are in a small, we are working still with a small sample. Um, now, I think uh, Julia had a question about uh, forward guidance and potentially forward guidance being about uh, reduction in uncertainty or being a risk premium uh, effect. So uh, we did have some results on this uh, in terms of the path factor. Path factor is typically associated with uh, forward guidance and uh, most of the variance, at least through the lens of what I did in the path factor comes from uh, movements in expectations about where the short-term uh, interest rate is going to be. It doesn't mean that the risk premium is irrelevant. There is also some risk premium component in the path factor. Uh, so yes, I would subscribe to the view that both of these forces are at play. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, in terms of COVID, uh, are, are these uh, results different uh, during the COVID period? Uh, do we see similar effects of the Fed policies uh, in that episode? So, uh, Michael, I don't know whether it's okay for me to show one slide. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. far away. And I, and I will try to, to do that, correct. Not, not the tech file this time. So, so we did something that, that speaks to that question. What did the Fed actually do during the COVID uh, period? So this is the S&P 500 index starting from January 2020 through the end of March. Uh, we know how dramatic it was, very big decline. Now, what you can do is to split it up and then ask what the particular Fed announcements were doing uh, and potentially how this uh, helped the stock market recover. So we did have very bad uh, growth news uh, uh, shock over that period. It contributed about 8% to the decline, but the major majority of the decline was because of the flight to safety. So this was a risk premium effect. Now, what I want to point out to is that very end of the sample, uh, when the Fed announces new measures, and you see that the recovery starts exactly uh, at that moment, which suggests again, that the reduction of uncertainty channel was there at play. If you think about how much the uh, standard monetary shock contributed to, uh, to the recovery, 
uh, you can see it at, in this blue line. So yes, the monetary easing did help uh, to some extent uh, through the, the reduction in the short-term interest rate, but it seems that, that a lot of the effect also came from the uh, preventing this kind of uh, enormous increase uh, uh, in uh, uncertainty about the real economy. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, Bo, I'm gonna hold you for just one more second. I'm gonna let Giovanni respond. It's been a long time since we heard his, his dulcet opening tone. So you can, uh, you can, there's a few things. And I think you said that, apologies if I misinterpreted your message, but I'm gonna ask you to respond to Saskia's question because no one's answered hers yet as well. But uh, any, anyway. any other responses you want to? Okay, let me uh, answer three things. So first of all, the point raised by uh, Eric and Michael. So there's something surprising about the argument they make that is the following. The market is as good as the Fed in forecasting everything but the rates. I find that argument is likely not appealing, fully not appealing. Now, if we think about the arguments we saw, there are two bits that are important. One is about the Fed being as precise as the medium forecast or the blue chip data or the SPF. And that will show that there's no superior information. Now, if you think about that argument, it's telling us that when we aggregate independent forecasters, the median of them is as good as the Fed. That tells us that the Fed has a very precise signal. So as long as the Fed is aggregating independently information, sampling independently information to form that forecast, that's gonna be an independent signal. And as Eric was saying, that mathematically should tell us that there is an information effect. So that's the first bit. The second bit is that when we control in those regression for other macroeconomic variables, then the information effect is absorbed. Of course, it should be like that. And the reason is, is that as long as we control for any variables that proxy for the macro state, that macro state will absorb the information effects, cannot be anything else. The only reason why we would use Green Book instead of Blue Chip or anything else is because it's a more accurate, more precise description of the forecast of the Fed itself. But anything else able to mop out that state of the economy that is part of the forecast era, that will do. And that's a kind of a strong prediction of any model of imperfect information. Now, let me uh, instead uh, add something about uh, the question how we disentangle. And, uh, and in doing that, let me just show quickly one slide. Uh, and is the, the following. So there are, as I was saying before, there are two ways to go here. One is to look at surveys, the other is to look at market. Now there are problems with surveys. I mentioned that before, you need essentially good surveys aligned with decision point. But when we look at market, we're making some strong assumption. Here, Refet was pointing to that. We essentially we assume that market can disentangle on impact in real time, all of the information in the, in the announcement. And we're also making very strong fundamental based pricing assumption on the stock price. Now, what you can see is that when you do that, as for example, in Janoshinsky card, you find relatively low correlation or not complete correlation between the information component, this info FF4, that would, would, you would find using the Green Book forecast. So the information, the correlation between the two information components is 0.15. So clearly something is opening. There's a gap there in the middle and that might be risk premium, maybe other things. The other thing that I want to show is the following chart. If you look at S&P 500, the top, you see the response to the entire sort of the row FF4 surprises, the monetary policy surprise as identified by us over the days, so quite on impact, and information component. You said markets do not distinguish them on impact, nor for 20 days. So there's to be other information from speeches, from data releases coming in to clarify that. Now, the last uh, point I want to make is about for our guidance, because so uh, Julia was pointing to that. There must be an effect for our guidance in reducing uncertainty. Now, these are the for guidance surprises of refet and quarters for the euro area. And as you can see from the introduction of the fall guidance here, and then the QE that was geared onto the fall guidance, the volatility of the surprises decreases dramatically. That's an information effect, but a different type of the ones we are discussing. 
And of course, as Refet was pointing out, any decision point is a risk event. So uncertainty has to drop after the resolution of that uncertainty. Now, the last sort of answer I owe is, uh, is uh, to uh, uh, Saskia. And, and I agree with that, that when you look at impulse response function, you find pretty sizable information effects. But that goes back to the point I was trying to make before. Even a small contamination, 7%, 10% of monetized policy prices from the state of the economy for information effects will induce large puzzles, large impulse response function. And the reason is that these are pervasive shocks across the economy. And that's an, a point that you can also make uh, econometrically. And that's actually what we do in the paper that has been accepted at JME on uh, proxy uh, Zvar. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, Bo, uh, I'll go to you and then I'm going to wrap up. Yep. Thank you, Michael. There is so much fascinating discussion that I want to respond to, but I raised my hand um, because of what Eric shared. So I'll stick to that in the interest of time. So, so first of all, Eric, I really appreciate the insight you shared. And I and I apologize that I wasn't being clear in my question because that was not inconsistent with the insight you share. So my question is really about this unconditional and unconditionality versus the situate being situated. It's a learning channel being situational, right? So, so I guess that I just wanted to make that absolutely clear that I'm not claiming that the Fed might on average or unconditionally have an information edge. I'm just saying that there might be situations, right? And then, so a couple of like almost corollaries or sub points to that um, prompted by this discussion. One is that Eric, you mentioned the March 2020 and on a um, thoughtfully showed the, the chart in terms of the stock price response. So I want to say that this March, I believe it's March 12th, when Fed unexpectedly, right, there was an intermeeting move, um, easing announcement, liquid, liquidity provision. Eric, you're absolutely right. First, with the usual claimer that this is my personal view, you're absolutely right that it's not like the Fed being public health experts knowing anything more about the COVID trajectory. But my personal view is that there are constant late night weekends emails going on monitoring every pocket of the financial sector. It's really the information edge over financial stability, which has even historically been a key part of the um, Fed responsibility that prompted the move. Again, personal view with the usual disclaimer. And so, so, so um, that's um, related to this. Uh, COVID episode, right? You also mentioned the counterfactual exercises. That's not the forecast per se, but rather the distributional properties of the growth. Um, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely important. And this is also related to Anna's work as well, to the extent that all these distributional properties, uncertainty, risk, is incorporated, is factored in the policy and the policy announcement. I wonder, right, if there is a sense that's also shifting the distribution and beliefs that the uh, economic decision makers have, right, in response to these um, announcements. And to that extent, this could be information effect, not on the first moment, but the distributional properties, right? And then the very last point I will say, Eric, is that uh, I think we're also on the same page, which is that I feel like to me, <laughs> this is a necessary battle for you guys to fight whether the Fed on uh, average unconditionally have an information advantage, right? For the information effect, for that learning channel to take hold, all that's required is there is a non-trivial faction of economic decision makers believe that there are situations where the Fed might know better about the state of affairs, right? And, and, and the salience of Fed policy announcements make that belief updating happen. So this could happen irrespective of their belief being correct or not. And so I just feel like it's a bit of overkill and it's totally unnecessary for the point that you and Michael are making here. And that's why um, I'm a bit confused as to, you know, why it has to be a, a crucial part of, of the argument. Okay, uh, so, okay, Eric, I'm gonna give you a few seconds. In, I'll, give, I'll give you the floor for a few seconds in a few seconds. I wanna add one thing. So, so Juan, just to acknowledge, I have seen your comment. Uh, it was, I, I think you were, you were arguing in favor of the ANA approach that we, you know, as, uh, as uh, when we're trying to ask these questions of the data, given these things are all going on in the data, we don't have the no news world. 
uh, that we're going to have to take account of all of them into effect. There was one other uh, question and someone couldn't ask a question. So I'm going to try something uh, and I'm going to try and represent some of the younger generation. I'm going to overshoot by a minute. Miguel, I, I, I'm going to try and let you speak. Can you speak? Sure, I think so. Okay, excellent. Can you hear me? Yeah, go. Okay, I was just going to chime in with one point, which is that, um, and sort of a suggestion for the literature in general, maybe, which is to say that, um, you know, I think what Anna's work shows in particular is that we may be limited in terms of, um, you know, because of this, the high frequency identification, which I think has a lot of benefits in terms of really isolating that, you know, this is communication from the Fed that we're measuring. Um, some drawbacks of the approach that only uses data from financial markets is that if we really want to try to uncover, you know, if we think that these information effects may exist, um, and we want to try to recover them from the data, um, you know, the presence of these risk premia, the fact that, um, I mean, I'll just leave it there, the presence of these risk premia sort of show us that maybe things like equity returns around the Fed's uh, announcements aren't maybe the most helpful variables in helping us to uncover these, these, these information effects. And maybe um, since this is a discussion about communication, you know, bringing in other alternative sources of data that can really help us to capture uh, a fuller picture of what the Fed is communicating about, I think would be um, maybe something that could really help us to disentangle all of these channels. Um, again, given the, the limitations potentially of only using financial market variables. Uh, th th thanks, Miguel. Uh, I promise I didn't plan to him to ask that question, but I can recommend some papers that have used text that, uh, that I have written that I would, uh, I, I would emphasize. Uh, anyway, uh, this is not promoting me. Eric, I'll let you have, have, have the word, then I'm going to wrap up because we've overshot by a few minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but um, just, just to respond to Bo, I think Michael and I agree that we're not trying to rule out the possibility that there could be information effects once in a while from time to time. Um, but it's just, there, there's a view in the literature, especially recently, that these information effects are large and pervasive. And our paper pushes back against that view pretty strongly. And so, so we've done many things to try to make the case that that is not, the, the, that that is not what's going on. Um, and I'll mention, you, you said one thing um, that, that's interesting, that it doesn't matter if there is an information effect or not, as long as people believe there is one. And so one of the things we did in our paper, one of the ways we pushed back against these views is we actually went and we surveyed uh, all of the blue chip chief economists ourselves, we sent them an email, we followed, you know, and, and we, uh, we asked them directly, like, you know, when, when the Fed makes these announcements, and we, we, you know, asked about different part, you know, when, when the Fed uh, changes the funds rate, when the Fed gives, you know, the statement, when the Fed releases its own forecasts of, of GDP and unemployment and, and inflation, how do you respond to that? How do you revise your forecast in response to that? So we were asking them directly, what do they believe? Uh, and if you look at the results in our paper, they the uh, essentially all of them do not revise their forecasts in the way an information effect would suggest. They they all revise their forecasts in either the traditional way or, or they just don't revise much in response to FOMC announcements at all because many of them said they get their information from um, speeches by the Fed chair, for example, or, or, or other communication by the Fed. Uh, so so again, it, it doesn't seem like at least among these professional forecasters that we have data on, they they don't seem to believe that there's a Fed information effect, which is not to say that there could never be one, but just most of the time, it just doesn't really seem to be a big issue. Okay, perfect. Uh, I am going to call it to a close there. I've overshot by five minutes. Um, I, I, have, I have enjoyed this uh, thoroughly, probably even more than I expected to, and I expected to enjoy it a great deal. Uh, I think uh, for those in the audience, um, particularly new researchers who are, who are, who are dipping into this for the first time. I think you, you'll have learned there's a lot of great work that has been done, but there's still a lot of great work to be done. Uh, one thing I definitely learned, which is the lesson Rafet taught me a few years ago, but I think we should promote as much as we want. The language we use in this is important. So, you know, one takeaway from Giovanni's work is, you know, shocks and surprises. You know, these are not equivalent. Let's, let's use the right language when talking about them. Um, I think that the implication of Eric and Mike's work about... Uh, about the, the, the likelihood, in fact, that the, the coefficients of the reaction function are changing and changing quite regularly. Um, and, and this, you know, it's, it's therefore hard to learn is a, is a fantastic uh, thing and area that people could work on. And then also uh, Anna's work, you know, thinking about the risk channels. And as I said already, um, you know, thinking about how communication itself is directly affecting the, these dimensions is, is, is another angle and, and, and uh, completely self 
uh, serving, I endorse Miguel's suggestion that everybody should start using things like text and other dimensions to bring to shed more light on this. At that, I am going to just thank everybody who's contributed, but especially to the three presenters who gave wonderful summaries of, a, of, a, of an interesting and complex literature. So Giovanni, Anna, Michael, thank you so much to everyone for joining. Thank you. And uh, stay tuned for the next event. Thank you.